Welcome to the Amash Files, your one-stop podcast for Justin Amash's March to the Presidency. Well, maybe not the presidency thing right now, but we will feature deep dives into who Justin Amash is, analysis from experts on libertarianism, and what the future of the Libertarian Party is with Justin Amash. If you're ready, let's get started. everybody. This is Eric Larson. Just stopping in before a conversation I had with Tyler. This is actually a conversation we had on May 19th, which is quite a while ago. It's almost three, four weeks now since uh, the announcement of Justin decided he wasn't going to run for president about a week before the Libertarian Presidential Nominating Convention. Uh, there was a lot of disappointment there, obviously by those of you listening to the show, and obviously us, since we had put a lot of time into this and we're really excited about his run. I'll let most of that discussion go uh, during the show, but I just want to say that we are planning on continuing the show. We have a couple, two more episodes that we had pre-recorded, actually, uh, so some of the conversation is a little bit funny there, obviously, since we didn't know at that time that Justin was not going to run. Um, so we're going to release those. We're going to have some other guests. We're going to try and really make this a fun show about libertarianism and sort of what what Justin Dimash's impact is going to be, and frankly, I don't think his story is done, and I, in fact, I'm certain it's not. Uh, I know it's not. And he's still a sitting congressman as a libertarian, the highest elected libertarian in the history of the party. And uh, he'll hold that distinction until someone wins something bigger, like a gubernatorial race or a senatorial race or the presidency. And so until that time, he will hold that distinction. And because of that, he has a big impact and I think has a big voice within the party and one that I think is really important and one that I think we are going to explore and see how this sort of works itself out. I want to provide encouragement to not only you, but Tyler and me as we continue the show. Be a little sporadic at first until we kind of get back into the groove. And certainly the content won't come out at the pace that it did initially with the excitement of the campaign beginning and really trying to help you get to know Justin better. But plan to have Justin on a couple times over the future. Uh, also talk to other people about things he's up to. He's obviously up to some things legislatively that I think are very interesting. And so we're going to talk about those as well. So enjoy the show. Keep your chin up. There's still a lot of things to be optimistic about. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Mosh Files. This is Eric. I'm along here with Tyler. Hey, everyone. Well, today's obviously a somber day. We're, it's a couple of days now since our good friend uh, Justin Mosh announced the suspension of exploratory committee to run for president of the Libertarian Party as for the nomination. And um, I think we'll just kind of begin by, you know, obviously the show is predicated on us talking about his run to the presidency and sort of talk about him and so people have a better understanding of who he is and what he's about and so his brand of libertarianism and, you know, what he hoped to accomplish. Well, that sort of, you know, that part, the presidential aspirations obviously came to an end. And so what do you, uh, I will get your thoughts first, Tyler. Um, you're the younger of the two of us by quite a bit. You just recently graduated from college a few years ago, so you're you're mid twenties. Oh, it was not about recent. It was like three and a half years ago. Yeah, Is it still recent to you? Right, a lifetime, a lifetime. I've almost, yeah, I've I've already passed my twenty fifth uh, high school uh, reunion. So that gives you an idea of the difference between us. Well, I, I'm twenty five years old, so that does give you a pretty good idea. Yeah. So, uh, you know, different generational change. So, I guess you know, what's your feeling on the announcement? I mean, I I kind of. I didn't really tell you when I found out because I, but we had planned something to go on uh, that the day he announced. But obviously, we, I, I canceled that uh, Saturday morning. So, what mm -hmm. was your feeling once you know you found out what was going to happen? Uh, I'll talk a little bit about history. I mean, I think I mentioned this. I, I sort of got involved in movement stuff, liberty movement stuff, through a combination of Justin Amash and Ron Paul. So I was in high school during Ron Paul's of uh, last presidential run, 2012 in the Republican Party. And I remember that he never did actually drop out, uh, despite the fact that he didn't win. He kept going all the way to the end, never surrendered his delegates, which is different than a lot of cases. But I remember being, I took a very long walk when he lost New Hampshire and when he lost Iowa by however many thousand votes it was. Uh, so I, I it, it's not an unfamiliar feeling, but those are, <laughs> and then Rand Paul 2016 as well, when he had the dismal Iowa performance and didn't show up well in New Hampshire either. So it, it, they, uh, I'm, I'm sort of used to the feeling of electoral dissatisfaction for preferred liberty movement candidates, but uh, this is sort of a – it's a different situation for me to have something kind of building and then just stop. 
So I don't know. It's it's uh, I'm not really sure what I feel. I'm not really sure what to think. Yeah, I think that's uh, you know. I, I sort of had a well. I mean, I've known this was going to happen for quite some time. Not the the suspension of the, the campaign, but the, the campaign launch for a long time. In that, it was something we, we talked about. And so, for me, there was a lot of anticipation of you know it's going to happen. And then I would ask on timing because, and then it, you know the the creation of the show was partly to help him and sort of I thought it'd be kind of fun and wave to introduce people to my friend and so they could you know learn more about him and. Uh, and so that was, you know, there's a lot of stuff sort of that kind of went into this and it was not a huge surprise to me when it, when he suspended, cause it, it you know, we'd sort of been talking about it for a couple of days. I mean, it was not, obviously it's not as you, you don't know him as well as I do, but you certainly know him well enough to know that he doesn't make spontaneous decisions. You know, I mean, with that, he doesn't really make decisions without a lot of uh, forethought and, you know, consideration and, um, mm-hmm. so, I mean, that's I what was, kind of surprised me. Sorry, go ahead. No. Yeah. Well, no. And I think, you know, uh, we obviously were prepared for his announcement before he announced it. And we were kind of waiting because it didn't happen quite the time we thought because things just happen and come up and stuff. And so it was, you know, a little delayed by a few days. And, um, and there was always a level of, uh, unsuredness, <laughs> whether we you know when it was going to happen or whether a hundred percent it would happen. And so it wasn't, um, a, tremendous surprise to me that when this happened but it was very disappointing and you know i mean obviously uh this was something i've been looking forward to for quite a while because i don't uh, just to like you i don't often have people who are really strong liberty candidates who win and certainly someone who's won as much as you know mm-hmm. justin had and so it was very unique mm-hmm. in that sense it was pretty pretty cool um so for me it was it was disappointing but uh i i think you things that aren't recognized and I think I'd just like to put this out there because, you know, right now people are dunking and, you know, on Justin or especially with the, like in the Libertarian Party, there are people, you know, claim that they forced him out. I, there wasn't a candidate in the race who made him drop out. <laughs> I can tell you that. There's no, no not one, at all. I mean, there was no one no. concerned him. I mean, it wasn't like he was worried about winning the nomination. I think he would have easily won it. But I think it came down to, uh, you know, very much what he said in his tweet. Like, you know, he wants to run a race to win, which is not. Uh, not usually the the direction the party takes as far as their their candidates. They don't usually run to win, and if they they don't care, oftentimes whether there's you know a pathway to victory. I, you know, the, one of the leading candidates, Jacob Hornberger, sp- explicitly said he didn't care how many votes he got. <laughs> it didn't matter to him. Yeah, which is, mm-hmm. I mean, there's no way in, in a political party anywhere else you could actually get away with something something like that and be considered you know credible. You know, and yet in the Libertarian Party. Mm-hmm. You can garner a decent amount of support for that, uh, but I think you know what Justin did by saying, you know, I'm if I'm going to do this, I'm going to you know really do it, and it just you know things just didn't line up properly for him, and so he thought, yeah, I just don't think it's probably the right thing, and I'm not going to announce the day before that I'm dropping out. I want to drop out as soon as I'm sure that I'm going to. That way, everyone has a time to figure things out. Like you know, they got a whole week, which mm-hmm. is not ideal, but I mean, it's a lot better than like a day or two. And um, I think it's, I think it's, he represents a little of a maturity that people don't recognize. I mean, a lot of people run in the Libertarian Party for president for vanity reasons or, you know, to sort of be the top of the heap. That was going to say ego, yeah. Yeah, I mean, sort of ego thing to get the top of the heap. Uh, you know, that wasn't what he was about. He wasn't, winning the nomination was never his primary goals. Obviously, it was your first goal in order to get to the, the, the next ones, but it was never something that was critical to him um it wasn't important to him in the sense that it didn't validate you know his existence or whatever i mean i think lots of these people run sort of as a way to validate their (laughs) self-worth i don't think he he felt like he didn't need to do Mm -hmm. that um and so i you know and he entered the race i think with humility which people i accuse him strangely of you know having it rigged or expecting just to walk through things. I don't think he ever really ran that way. I think he expected to win, but I don't think he ever went through this, the assumption that he didn't have to, to prove the, prove himself to delegates. And so I, I don't think he conducted mm-hmm. himself that way, but you know, that's just my opinion, obviously, which and I'm clearly I'm biased. Um, so I guess uh, again, I'm disappointed, but I'm, I'm also optimistic and this is, and this is the thing that is hard right after this ha- sort of thing happens because, you know, you get the participation builds up and you're ready and you're ready to go and then things don't turn out the way you do. But he's only 40 years old. 
And I think that's something that's easy to forget. And so, uh, you know, I, I think the, the next thing is sort of what, what is, what's he going to do next? I mean, he's still the, the first and the highest ranked libertarian in the history of the United States, um, as a congressman for another, I don't know, nine months or so, or maybe eight, I'm trying to think what month it is now, uh, through the end of actually December. So he's still going to be the only libertarian congressman. And, um, you know, whether he decides to um, reactivate his congressional camp- campaign and run, I think he's probably going to think about what he wants to do there. Uh, I don't, I think people assume he's absolutely going to, but I think, you know, there's, that's still something he's got to figure out what he wants to do. Cause he had suspended that in February. He said, you know, I'm running for president. I'm mm-hmm. not doing so. It's entirely possible to do something else. But I don't think he's going away. Uh, in our conversations we've had privately, I mean, he's like, you know, I'm the the Republican Party is not a path that you can be someone who supports liberty and be successful, uh, or at least you can't change the party enough to meaningfully uh, change its course. And the Democratic Party, you can't either. So really, the only option is the Libertarian Party. And so the qu- the question, I guess, is. You know, can the Libertarian Party become that? And uh, so I, I'm optimistic because I know he's not going going away. And whatever happens, he's still going to be around for a little while, in whatever capacity. Yeah, I mean, it's different. I feel it's sort of there wasn't a lot of time for momentum to build. I think there was some, and I think it was growing, but it wasn't like a the culmination of years and months of effort and campaigning and movement building and. It was sort of short, and it was sort of, you know, I think he's very intentional in calling it an exploratory committee, and I think he was sincere, and he was exploring the viability of pursuing this course of action. And obviously he chose that it was not viable for the purposes he was trying to accomplish, and I think, you know, I think there's a lot of things that are particular about 2020 that might make that so. I mean, it's very likely that you can't really campaign or for the foreseeable future, you can't have gatherings in a traditional sense or rallies or fundraisers or, or anything that you would expect to see in a presidential campaign. It's likely right. we won't see that. Or if we do see it, it's at a very diminished rate. And I think that that would make a very different campaign. And when you have those limitations, it's harder for an alternative voice to gain more prominence. So I, he sort of touched on that. Uh, and there's, I don't know, it's, I understand why he did it. And I, I won't lie, I'm disappointed too. I was looking forward to this. I've admired him for a very long time, and his political voice, I think, is one that America needs desperately. But running for president is not the only way to articulate that voice. Uh, it's not the only way to spread that message. So I, I'm optimistic, in a sense, but still disappointed, I guess. Yeah, well, I mean, I think disappointed is, I mean, that's probably an understatement for a lot of people. Uh, but, you know, it is what it is, and and it's very easy for someone who's, on the outside saying, well, you know, you should run for president or you do whatever because I'm not the one doing any of the work. <laughs> and so it would be very simple for me to just, to, you know, uh, again, impose sort of my, what I, my, my dreams and aspirations on someone else and make them go do the dirty work. Right. And, um, yeah. So very non-libertarian to do. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, and, and that kind of, I guess this gets, this sort of drives to the next point of the, that I'd like to discuss is, you know, this show has been, uh, it was obviously chronicling Justin and his run, but I think, you know, Justin's impact in the libertarian party. And I think in the libertarian political political sphere, let's call it, I, I don't think it's going to go away by not running for president this election cycle. I think again, he's going to be in Congress to the end of this year. And you know, if you, if he doesn't run for reelection, then he's going to be out of politics, I guess for two years. And then I think, you know, if he either decides to run for some other office uh, or maybe he starts running for president. I mean, you know, the presidential run, quite frankly, actually begins if you, if you knew you were going to run for president in 2024, for sure. Well, then you run a lot, you start a lot sooner. Right. I mean, that was also the thing that probably hamstrung his mm-hmm. campaign too. He was, he was coming in it was late really start. late. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was super late and it was because of obviously all the circumstances, the impeachment and COVID-19 and all this stuff. And, you know, you, I, you can argue one way or the other what would have been best, but I think, I kind of think with the same, same, in some sense, we would have been in the same place at the end. I mean, I, I think it still would have, you still would have felt like any momentum you could have had early, you would have probably lost by the time you got to this, got to this point. Because once the coronavirus, I mean, I don't even know where Joe Biden is. I think he's in his basement somewhere. I'm not sure. I mean, I think, 
a bunker. Of yeah, some right. Kind. I mean, yeah. he probably is taking like dude videos holding up the New York Times to prove that he's still alive. You know, he's got like today's <laughs> date or something. They got a body double. <laughs> uh, but I think you know what what our vision. We've talked about this a little bit before. Is I think you know what what we're hoping is this show is, is to continue. You know, hopefully have Justin on get his vision for what libertarianism is for him and what the direction the party needs to go because. You know, our, our opinion of what the party should be is a little different than what others. You know, I think, you know, the Hornberger represents that sort of other idea that the party is not a vehicle to, for, to win elections. It's a vehicle for political change or convincing people of political views, I suppose. Uh, but mm-hmm. uh, but I think, you know, that we're going to talk about that. And I think we'll talk about what for black veteran, what like Hayekian sort of uh, a view view of the world. Yeah, Hayekian classical liberalism, I think, is... is- yeah. Fairly consistent. Yeah. So classical liberalism and, you know, how it fits in the political landscape. Because I, I think, although libertarianism, the term is people won't describe themselves as libertarian, there are so many issues and thing, uh, aspects of libertarianism that are very appealing, the classical liberal, uh, to both people who might consider themselves liberal or conservative. I think there's actually room to have a decent-sized coalition, and you probably could get a decent amount of voters. You're not going to get someone who's going to, you know— want to end simultaneously end the fed and decriminalize all drugs, but you might get people who are pretty much with you on a lot of things. And then, you know, not others. And it's all about personality and, you know, how effective you can be politically and getting things. Yeah. Done. And you know, it's, it's obviously, it's not decriminalizing marijuana on a federal level is different than legalizing all recreational drugs for every reason. Those are two different things, but I don't think that you can say from a Liberty perspective or from a limited government perspective that, decriminalization of marijuana at a fair level is not a good thing. That's something that libertarians should support, even if it's not what everyone's ideal necessarily is. And I'm, I'm not necessarily advocating for that one way or the other. But I think that there's – we talked about this in the debate episode a lot. There's movements that can be made in a positive direction for liberty that are consistent with libertarian values or classical liberal values that you could build a coalition of Americans to support. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. It can be – incremental again like i mentioned before in the Berkian sense the Hayekian sense you don't need to go zero to a hundred or a hundred to zero however you want to phrase it immediately yeah i think i think it's important to look at the it, it's uh, the question if you know if you let's say you elected 100 libertarians to congress this election cycle which is not uh, you know not, not going to happen but let's say you did you're you're not going to suddenly have abolition of all these these departments you're not going to have defunding of department of education all this sort of thing now you'll probably have a very radically different conversation when it comes to budgetary concerns the debt um, civil liberties and you're going to have a lot more voices that are going to be clamoring for change but it's not going to be radical change in the sense that they're going to be again going to you know nothing right there that Mm. is the direction you're going and so it's sort of like would you rather have a bunch of people who are with you partly who are willing to go with you partway to a smaller budget or to, you know, a less aggressive foreign policy. Well, I think if you're a libertarian, I think unless you're, I I don't know why you wouldn't support that, even though it may not be your ultimate goal, but you know, no one really, no one in politics ever gets their ultimate goal. Really? I mean, I don't think even, Mm -hmm. even as Bernie Sanders is campaigning, I'm sure he's like, well, these are kind of watered down socialist, you know, (laughs) policies. But it's the best I can hope for is like, yes, you know, <laughs> and it's hard just to pay parts, for yeah. all college yeah. or something, you know, a college where he thinks probably everything should be totally free, everything. Right. But um, so I mm-hmm. think, you know, it, there's there's a practical level of, you know, if you want the party to be practical, if you want to actually achieve political success, you have to accept the fact that you're going to have. You're going to have to accept an incremental sort of change because you want it at least to incrementally mm-hmm. go in the right direction. I mean, clearly. And I, and by that I too mean I think you know you look at Democrats and Republicans they're pretty much on they're in line with each other in most most of what they want to do I mean I think Michael Mal different degrees different different perhaps different steps on the same ladder but they're going the same direction yeah I mean I think Michael Malice would say you know conservatism is just progressivism going the speed limit or something like that and I think I think there's some mm-hmm. truth to that I mean when you look at Dem- Democrats I don't know if I go that far but there's a <laughs> there's a something to consider yeah I mean I. Th- I think, you know, when it comes to spending, you don't see any, there's no dis- dissent and discussion when it comes to massive budget deficits or r- running for well, debt. not anymore. There there used to be, like seven or eight years ago, there used to be some of that, but now that's kind of all gone away. It, it, you know, it, it, you you say that, and I, I partially agree, but I would look at, um, 
I look back even to like 1994 with the Republican Revolution, where they first took back, where the Republicans took back the House for the first time in like I don't know 40, 50 years or something like that. Newt Gingrich is in charge uh, with a contract with America, mm-hmm. and um, you know it was all about the the spending and stuff. But it was because there was a Democrat in that White House. I mean, as soon as there a Republican takes over, oh sure, oh sure, right? It's sort of like you know the the left is all for, against war. Saw the same thing with Obama, right. absolutely, with the Republican House opposition to Obama, same thing, right? And, well, right, absolutely, and then when. When you don't have when you don't have to actually take responsibility for it, <laughs> it's a lot easier to um, to be oppositional. Like it's a lot easier to be anti-war when George Bush is conducting the war, and then as soon as Obama is like, well, you know, it turns out actually the president should have the authority to do whatever they want, bomb, you know, secret kill lists and drones in Yemen mm-hmm. or whatever. And then as soon as Trump's like, mm-hmm. oh my God, these wars are terrible. I can't believe this, you know, such aggressive foreign policy. Uh, yeah. And you know, Republicans, vice versa. It's like you know, kind of the same thing. So. I do, but I do think there is a. I think there's a possibility you could carve out, and you could almost, if you wanted the Libertarian Party, you could potentially be that party that's like we're just gonna be the classical liberal party, and then there's the other guys. And, you know, maybe you could, could almost like force the Republicans and Democrats currently into either you carve a lot of them out into your coalition, the ones who actually want you know civil liberties and um, controlled budgets and you know classical liberal positions, and those who are support bigger big government solutions. And you could potentially have two opposing parties there because I think eventually you're going to have to have two parties the way our system works. But I think that's I think that'd be the only yeah, short term goal. Know, I, I, there's something I want to touch on. You mentioned it like 10 minutes ago. I didn't talk about it then uh, w- about what the purpose of a party is. And you and I have talked about this a lot, both on and off the show. But I don't think that political parties are the way that you prompt ideological change. I think uh and this is another Hayek thing. And I, I, by the way, I, I don't hate Mises at all. I studied Hayek and Mises very intently when I was in college. Uh, love them both dearly. I think they have a tremendous amount of insight. They're great philosophers and economists. But this is a Hayekian point. So just don't don't think I hate Mises. Uh, I don't. But Hayek talks about how ideas are transmitted through society. And it, there's an, uh, uh, there is an essay called The Intellectuals and Socialism, where he talks about his idea for what prompts ideological change. And his hypothesis is that it's intellectuals, or what he calls the secondhand dealers of ideas. Essentially, that just means people who influence the thoughts and hearts and minds of others. Not necessarily people who come up with the ideas, like not Hayek or Mises, but someone like Henry Hazlitt, who's writing about Hayekian and Misesian ideas in a popular setting. He's an influencer. He's an intellectual influencing. And I think he did. If you look back at like the history of libertarian thought in America, he... I truly think brought thousands of people and exposed them to his ideas for the first time that Hayek sitting alone and publishing would not have been able to do. So maybe political parties could have some of those people, but political parties, I think, fundamentally exist to win elections or to gain power. Uh, Not to say they couldn't do other things, but I, I think that if you try to make the Libertarian Party into a book club or something, I, I don't think that's it's not making the best use of what it is as a resource. It's not letting – not specialization of labor for another economic term. You're not letting the party do what a party does best. Yeah. I mean I think it's it's like a, it's like using a screwdriver when you should be using a hammer. I mean I think you know, you use a, the mm. political party is used in order to advance things politically <laughs> when it comes to uh, in elections. Uh, that's really the only goal of a, a party is to gain power uh, through – and, you know, your strategy can be different. You could say, well, we should work on the local level. We should work on the, you know, county or the state or the federal level. You know, where should we put devoted resources, certain states, regions, whatever. I mean, I think those are all discussions that are worthy of the party. But I think the party has to ultimately be focused on um, it, on actually attracting as many voters as possible, getting a coalition that can be sizable enough to actually make a change and, and make a difference and, and win. Because if you don't win, mm-hmm. you're not, you're not going to be very credible as a party. Right. You know, it's very – politics is downstream of culture. Culture is downstream of ideas. Politics are important, but political change comes from previous cultural and ideological and societal change. It doesn't come through the, – the, the politics is the last step of that process. It's an important step, but it's one you have to take, but it's not the start of it, and I would argue not the most important one. Yeah, and I think, you know, there are plenty of examples you see see now uh, recently. Like, let's just look at marijuana decriminalization and, and that process – uh, it wasn't. It wasn't through a political party. the The Republicans and Democrats were one hundred percent against the opening up of medical marijuana. Mm-hmm. It was only through 
basically, uh, you know, ballot initiatives and 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 through the the culture, essentially accepting the fact that and the people, you know, accepting that mm-hmm. that it's a viable sort of position to have. It wasn't. It reflected a changing set of sentiments that enough people held to legalize it through ballot initiative or whatever other method was used in the states where it's currently legal to use recreationally. Right, and but that was laid down that that was laid out not by parties, but it was it was laid out by mm-hmm. the the people or advocates or you know thought groups those sorts of things. Grassroots advocacy, yeah. really. I think I think if you look, I mean, at it was it, there yeah. was a cultural shift, right? It was a cultural change that that led to mm-hmm. its success in. And but only through that d- did it work. It wasn't because any party took a radical position on it. Because you wouldn't do that because you have to, you're trying to win votes. <laughs> uh, and had a party mm-hmm. done that, oh by the way, that was the Libertarian Party. They weren't successful with that. Even though you can say, well, hey, that was a super popular position to have. Or you know, you could look at gay marriage, and that was another position that has always been you know supported by the Libertarian Party. Uh, but it, but they've never had any electoral success with it because they were they were not. It was it was one in other ways outside of the actual party process, right? Right. It's not. It wasn't a political mechanism, and it, like I would say the same thing with gay marriage legalized at a federal level. It was a reflection of changing societal norms and understandings. I don't think it was like a political sea change that happened. I think it was just a reflection of what more yeah. people were thinking. And, and th- that's not to mean that people can't be radical within parties and suggest things, because I mean. It, you could look at Trump's a great example of A-B testing, right? He says one thing, says another thing, and see and kind of sees what the response is. And then he's like, okay, well, that's my position because that was more popular and that works with people. And so it's entirely, you know, the, mm. you, you definitely saw people who took positions on marijuana, who took positions on gay marriage before other ones because they recognized there was a shift in the, the populace. But it was not them out in front. I mean, I think, you know, the, the notion of some leader being someone who's going to usher in, you know, new radical new thought, I think is... Uh, is it doesn't happen i think i mean it, not in our not at least in our polity yeah with the, not on a political level no. no it might be like a philosopher or something who's for like marx might be a not a good example but someone who was pronouncing a philosophy that then became influential uh even if they didn't do it in a political method uh, people are gonna roast us for talking about marx on a libertarian <laughs> podcast uh just the first guy that came to mind. Uh, I don't. I'm not a Marxist. I don't like Marx. Uh, You're more a shade an example guy, of someone yeah, who was a, a thinker. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, <laughs> those guys. People who um, prompted a philosophical change rather than a solely political one. Yeah. I well, say. I mean, and this is like it's maybe not fair because this is obviously you know I'm just an anesthesiologist talking about this, but you look at you know let's say like Hitler. I mean, clearly, if you're an authoritarian, you can definitely move the pol the politics the way you want to if you have complete power that's different in our it, you have total control yeah, over I mean, it, yeah. It's, it's a lot different in our system where you have to actually have the con, have generalized consent uh i guess you'd argue that hitler probably had on some level had consent to the uh, the governed uh, too because you know you can't completely rule even as an authoritarian without at least important power structures in in support of you but that being the case at least in our system you actually have to have real coalitions of voters and people who support those positions this is kind of like a long-winded way of saying that mm-hmm. I think, you know, ultimately, I don't think Justin's going away. I think he's going to stick around with the party. And and, and the, the question, I guess, is what's he going to do in the meantime? Because I think, I'm guessing he's going to, to whether he goes, runs for Congress again or not, he's still going to be part of the party. He's still going to be looking to try and build a coalition. Because I think he probably would have designs in running in 2024, 2028 or something like that. Uh, but you just have to keep the, your name ID out there and, you know, you're at least we're at a sitting congressman at some point. So you have some sort of credibility within the the main media. And he would have the advantage of having mm-hmm. lots of time. So that would make it a lot easier, at least within the Libertarian Party. And I think the Libertarian Party, for very good reasons, was somewhat skeptical of the fact that he might just, you know, use and abuse them and just kind of disappear after two years, as they've had happen with other candidates who've been the nominee for president. Sure. And I think that I, I don't think the the fear is unvalid. I just think it was unvalid when applied to Justin Hamash. It might apply to other former Republicans turned libertarian. Well, though. I mean, I just know him. And so it's easy for me to say, well, that's this is not true. Well, yeah. So right. we, we can say that, of course. <laughs> I, but I, if people don't know him, people don't know about him. They were just talking smoke, you know, if they don't. Yeah. They and don't get and I and I don't blame anyone for being suspicious or concerned or, you know, wondering about those sorts of things. I think those are, that's mm-hmm. a completely legitimate thing, because. If you've had that happen a bunch of times, you know, shame on me, shame, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me, right? 
and um, uh, so mm-hmm. I think I think he's we'll see what he does in the next couple of years. But I think I mean my hope is that we'll keep the show going. I think we're going to try and have some fun and talk about meet some interesting people, talk about some interesting thoughts, middle political theory. What and I think probably following the, the Libertarian Party and kind of seeing what's going on. I don't want to get too much into the inner workings of the uh, the machinations of the, the National Party and stuff. But I I think it would be. I would like this to be a resource, I think, for people who are looking into what libertarianism is and what what the Amash sort of style of libertarian and the vision is for a party politically and, you know, how do, mm-hmm. how can you be successful? Because I think ultimately if you want to you want to win, whatever the libertarian party's done up to this point has not worked. <laughs> because the although you could argue the last election yeah. cycle was the most successful ever. It was you know, like I think we talked to Matt Welch, he said it was the the best libertarian campaign ever and the worst right, simultaneously because you you saw that you potentially had this you know <laughs> yeah. tremendous opportunity and you didn't capitalize on it but you did get the most votes ever and it's the highest percentage and it gave easy ballot access for lots of states which is a huge benefit to the party and not having to use so many resources petitioning and spending you know spending lots of money just getting on the stupid ballot so anyway i think you know mm-hmm. that that's probably the hardest question is, you know, how exactly does the Libertarian Party become successful and how does it really, it has to supplant one of the other parties. I mean, how do you do that? To go, well, <laughs> we'll find out. Yeah. I think, I think that's the, uh, that's a, the million or billion dollar question. Uh, so we're going to have a couple more episodes come out, which obviously are going to, we, we recorded them on <laughs> We recorded a bunch of them with Kirk Couchman, who gave us a good synopsis of what was going on with Syria. And then we talked about the balanced budget amendment. And then also, um, uh, what, was the, what was the third one we did? I can't remember now. It was a marathon session we did. Put me on the yeah. spot. I can't remember either. It was like two yeah. hours long. There was a lot we going had a lot. on. And so we were going to release these over time. And of course now, it's, so it's, we'll go over them in the during the extra episode. I'll talk about it ahead of time, just so you know that. You know, obviously, we talked about this before. We knew he was not going to be running anymore. Uh, but there, there, there were some references to like staffing yeah, right. the Amash administration uh, I mean, that are not I mean, as I relevant think, so much anymore. I'm so hopeful that we can do that in four years. I mean, I'm I'm happy taking him taking power in 2025. That's I'm okay with that. So, um, but mm-hmm. Surgeon General, I, Eric I don't know Larson. that I would be a part of the administration. I don't know that I have any experience with that, but. Um, I, there is, I mean, this is the first anesthesiologist ever, actually, who is the Surgeon General, which is actually, you know, not many people know, but uh, it is also interesting that he's the first Surgeon General to, and he's an anesthesiologist, and he canceled surgeries, <laughs> the whole coronavirus. So, his, some great irony. <laughs> I've had many surgeons remind me of that, and it, yeah, it's actually pretty funny. So, uh, well, anyway, Will, uh, I hope you continue to subscribe and listen to the show. I think we're going to have some really cool, fun things to, to talk about. Obviously, suggestions are always welcome at uh, amashfiles at gmail.com continue to share with your friends and we'll keep putting out some great content I think we'll have some thanks for listening to the Amash Files please subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast player and share it with your friends we'd appreciate it if you left a written and five star review too send all questions and guest ideas to amashfiles at gmail.com.